Welcome to Grab the MD. Be sure to subscribe, give a thumbs up, and spread the word. Okay, so in the previous video about pressure, flow rate, and resistance, we mainly focused on arteries. Let's talk a little about veins before we begin our discussion about cardiac output and venous return curves. When comparing veins and arteries, one of the properties that we look at is compliance. In simple words, compliance tells us how easy it is to dilate a vessel and keep it dilated, as shown in the animation above. Compliance is the opposite of elasticity. Simply put, elasticity tells us how quickly a vessel goes back to its original shape after we dilate it, again shown in the animation. Veins are easily dilated because they have thinner walls. That makes them vessels of compliance and that's why our body uses veins for storage of blood. In comparison, the arteries are elastic because of their thicker muscular walls, so they have decreased compliance which makes them high pressure vessels and the body uses arteries to feed the organs. So how do we calculate compliance? We have an equation for that. Compliance equals volume of blood divided by driving pressure. Understanding and applying the concept of this equation is important rather than calculation itself. We talked about driving pressure inside the arteries in the previous video. So let's talk about driving pressure inside the veins. It's called mean systemic pressure or mean systemic filling pressure. It's the same thing. In simple words, it's a pressure that drives the blood inside the veins towards the right atrium. This means mean systemic pressure must be higher than pressure inside the right atrium. Otherwise, blood would not move towards right atrium. In a normal healthy person, mean systemic pressure is around 7 mm of mercury. And the right atrial pressure is somewhere between 0 and 5 mm of mercury. That's why veins can drain into right atrium under normal conditions because the blood inside them is being pushed by the mean systemic pressure. Let's rearrange our equation of compliance for mean systemic pressure. Pressure equals volume of blood divided by compliance. Pressure in this case is the mean systemic pressure. This equation tells us if we increase the volume of blood in veins, we can increase the mean systemic pressure which means more blood coming back to right atrium. If we decrease the volume of blood, mean systemic pressure also decreases. Similarly, if we increase compliance of veins or make them more dilated, there will be lesser pressure inside them. If we decrease compliance of veins or make them more constricted, the mean systemic pressure inside the veins goes up, meaning more blood coming back to right atrium. This discussion is important when we are talking about cardiac and vascular function curves. It's a graph that depicts the relationship between right atrial pressure or end diastolic volume and cardiac output and venous return. Cardiac output is shown here by a red curve which tells us as we increase the end diastolic volume, meaning we are putting more blood into the heart, the cardiac output keeps increasing up to a certain point, after which it's physiologically not possible to increase it any further. That's why cardiac output curve becomes flat after this point. The venous return curve is drawn in blue. We have a maximum venous return when the right atrial pressure is zero. As we increase the right atrial pressure, venous return starts decreasing until a point where venous return becomes zero. At this point, right atrial pressure equals mean systemic pressure. That's why zero blood is coming back to right atrium. So this point where venous return curve intercepts the x-axis tells us the value of mean systemic pressure. Normally, it's about 7 mm of mercury. The point where venous return and cardiac output curves cross each other shows us the operating point of hurt. That is, cardiac output and venous return are equal at this point, 
which really means the herd is pumping out all the blood that is coming back as venous return. If we draw a straight line down this operating point, we can determine the value of right atrial pressure for this particular setting. Let's say everything is normal, so we will have a normal right atrial pressure of between 0 to 5 millimeters of mercury. Being able to determine right atrial pressure from this graph is very important because examiners can test you on this by giving you such a graph, a value for total peripheral resistance and ask you to calculate mean arterial pressure. Your first step would be determining the cardiac output and the right atrial pressure from the given graph. If right atrial pressure is normal, you can ignore it and use the equation mean arterial pressure equals cardiac output multiplied by total peripheral resistance. But if you find out that right atrial pressure is higher than normal, you should use the equation mean arterial pressure minus right atrial pressure equals cardiac output multiplied by total peripheral resistance. Solving this for mean arterial pressure gets us cardiac output multiplied by total peripheral resistance plus right atrial pressure. So we have to be extra careful when dealing with such a question, especially when they give us such a graph. That's not the whole story for these curves. We can change certain things and move the operating point of her one way or another. Let's see how we can do that. Number one, we can bring changes to the hurt muscle itself, for example, by changing its inotropy, which is a fancy word for contractility. If we increase inotropy or contractility, it means the hurt is beating with more force, so we will get increased cardiac output, which shifts the cardiac output curve up. When we decrease inotropy, Contraction force is weaker, which results in decreased cardiac output, and the cardiac output curve is shifted downwards. So, increasing the inotropy shifts the operating point up, and decreasing the inotropy brings the operating point down, which really means that if we keep the right atrial pressure or preload constant, we will get increased cardiac output for the same amount of preload when we increase inotropy and a decreased cardiac output for the same preload when we decrease inotropy. So how do we increase inotropy or contractility? By using catecholamines or digoxin. And when do we get a decreased inotropy? During uncompensated heart failure and opioid or narcotic overdose which decreases sympathetic activity that results in decreased force of contraction. It's important to note here that changing the inotropy does not change the mean systemic pressure. It stays the same because we are not altering anything about the veins yet. We only change the force of contraction of cardiac muscle. Yes, Changing things about veins can also change these curves. Let's see how. One of the things we can change about veins is we can increase the volume of blood inside them. This increased amount of blood inside the veins means more blood will be coming back to hurt. That is, we have increased the venous return. We can also increase the venous return by increasing the venous tone which means we are constricting or squeezing the veins out of blood. Increasing the venous return by either of these two mechanisms shifts the venous return curve upwards. The opposite is also true. If we decrease the volume of blood or decrease the venous tone, venous return decreases and the curve moves down. So increased volume of blood or increased venous tone shift the normal operating point up and decreasing the volume of blood or venous tone shift the operating point down. We can see that increasing the venous return also increases the right atrial pressure compared to normal and decreasing the venous return decreases the right atrial pressure. 
We should also note here that changes to winds also change the mean systemic pressure. So increased Venus return gives us increased mean systemic pressure and a decreased Venus return also decreases the mean systemic pressure. As per the equation we discussed earlier in this video, you can think of compliance as opposite of Venus tone. So how do we increase the volume of blood? By giving normal saline. And how do we increase Venus tone? By activating sympathetic system which increases alpha-1 activity on veins and results in venous constriction. What decreases volume of blood? Hemorrhage, that is when we are losing blood. Similarly, we can decrease venous tone by giving someone spinal anesthesia, which decreases sympathetic activity and alpha-1 stimulation that results in venous dilation. Up till this point, we have seen what happens to cardiac output and venous return curves when we change certain things about cardiac muscle or the veins? What if we bring changes to the arteries? Before doing that, we have to see what's going on normally inside the arteries. Blood is pumped by the heart and travels inside the arteries until it reaches the arterioles. Arterioles provide resistance to blood flow as total peripheral resistance, which slows down the speed of blood flow. Blood then enters the capillary bed, into the venules, and finally returns back to the heart inside the veins as venous return. So we can change total peripheral resistance, which alters the cardiac output venous return curve. Let's see how. We have our normal cardiac output venous return curve. Let's say we constrict the arterioles using vasopressors. That will result in increased total peripheral resistance. Increasing the TPR has two effects. Number one, the blood flow from arteries to veins is further slowed down, which means veins are now bringing back lesser amount of blood, so the venous return is decreased. And number two, when we decrease venous return, it means less blood coming into the heart, so heart pumps out less blood, which results in cardiac output being decreased. So increasing TPR decreases venous return and cardiac output, and we will have new curves which are both below the normal curves. These new curves tell us that increasing the TPR shifts the operating point down. The opposite is also true. If we decrease TPR, venous return and cardiac output are increased, the curves are higher up and the operating point is shifted up. So how do we decrease TPR? We can do so during exercise which results in vasodilation of arterioles in the skeletal muscles. So the TPR is reduced. Or we can have a fistula between an artery and a vein, which bypasses the arterioles so blood is not slowing down. Instead, it's coming back quickly to the veins and back to the heart, giving us increased venous return and increased cardiac output. So arterial venous fistula is like decreasing the total peripheral resistance. How do we get an AV fistula? We create AV fistula in a patient undergoing dialysis. A stab wound can create an AV fistula. And people with Page's disease of bones have lots of AV fistula inside their bones. That's why their cardiac output is increased which can result in high output cardiac failure and their bones are warm to touch on examination. Notice how the right atrial pressure remains the same whether we increase or decrease total peripheral resistance. Similarly, changing the TPR doesn't affect mean systemic pressure. It stays the same. Before we leave, let's talk about active hyperemia and reactive hyperemia because I couldn't find any place else to fit it in. Hyperemia means increased blood flow. Both types are seen during exercise. 
active hyperemia is seen when doing endurance or dynamic exercise, for example running. What happens is as soon as we start running, there is immediate vasodilation inside muscles due to release of local vasodilators, which results in immediate increase in blood flow to the muscle termed active hyperemia. Let's say this is the level of blood flow when we are resting, and this is the point where we start running. The increase in blood flow during active hyperemia will look something like this, with this being the peak blood flow. Reactive hyperemia is seen when doing high intensity static exercise, for example, weight lifting. When we lift a weight, there's initial vasoconstriction due to compression of vessels by contracting muscle. So we see a period of decreased blood flow to the muscle, then a short period of ischemia or no blood flow, and later very high blood flow when we put down the weight. Let's say this is the resting blood flow. This is where we lift the weight. Soon after, the blood flow goes down. Then there is zero blood flow or ischemia. When we put down the weight here, there is a massive blood flow with a peak here. And then it slowly comes back to normal. If we take a muscle sample at all stages, we will notice a color change from normal pink to pale to red and back to pink. We get the pale color because of the brief ischemia and the excess of blood flow gives us the red color. If we increase duration of occlusion, we will see more and more reactive hyperemia. Reactive hyperemia is also seen in heart muscle right after a myocardial infarction, mechanism is pretty much the same. That brings us to the end of this video. I will see you in the next one. So have fun till then and don't forget to subscribe.